Hey, buddies, Potato Big Whiskey here, and welcome back to the Humankind tutorial series. We're making slow and steady progress, and we're going quite slow that we can talk about everything that's happening. So we just got um, a follow up to an event that was in a previous episode that had to do with music. And this will move us more in the direction of authority, sadly, which means we do lose one of those nice bonuses that we had from our ideology. We were getting that two influence on emblematic districts. I'd like to move more towards Liberty. However, we do pick up an extra five stability from that, which is very handy. Cool, we won this battle and I still I'd like to get another turn of healing on these guys so I'm gonna pick up this curiosity and then stand on top of a hill because no matter which direction I get attacked from I should have at least two hill tiles to defend from these guys and I want to get more kills in particular I'm looking for at least three more kills so I can pick up another era star because the other player in the game the green player has three already so they're kind of steaming ahead a little bit so i need to kind of catch up to them however i, I tend to in these games i tend to fall behind Greetings a little bit in the, the early game and then kind of accelerate very fortune. quickly plus we can actually be pretty aggressive be against the mycenaeans here because we we, we still only have want? tolerate skirmishes so i can kind of pop in there and ruin their day if i wish now i think this is enough health and these guys are on a river so I feel like I can justify attacking them like this so they have nothing but river tiles um, to work with. And if they try to play defensively across the river, I can just pressure their flag and, you know, pepper them down with archers. So I'll play it safe with my current positioning is fine. Archers on the high ground, swordsmen by the river, and I'll end my deployment. So it looks like they are playing uh, safe on the river. I can actually cross the river. Let's say, let's say I try to attack this archer, okay? I would take a minus three from being on the river and then that would open up me up to some really bad stuff. Whereas if I come to this tile and then attack, I won't take that minus three and I'll actually do a lot more damage to that archer. So I think I will do that, especially because this guy is already hurt and it's very easy to do damage and kill units this game if they're already hurt. Now, can I kill that archer? I have a chance to kill that archer. That does leave you open, but I can shoot you from the high ground. Now I could in theory run forward and shoot this archer too with one of my own archers and if I position him carefully it would be great. I'd be worried about counterattacks. I think I'm just going to play it safe and bow down this chariot a little bit to bring his combat strength down slightly and then I'll, 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 I'll pray for the high roll on this archer. It's unlikely. This guy has a little bit more health so I'm okay with him being on the river tile taking that combat penalty. Um, that doesn't bother me so much even if he gets attacked by both of these and the chariot's more likely to come from my archers. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. So yes, the chariot does a lot of damage but because we're uphill we have a little bit of an advantage. All right, let us kill there. You will flank this guy. You'll fire and you'll fire. And then this guy will finish him off. Right, he's already dead, perfect. So hopefully that explained a little bit of the combat there. Uh, rivers are bad. You don't want to be standing on rivers. If you're standing on rivers, you will take more damage. Hills are good. If you're on high terrain, you will take less damage and do more damage. So hills, good for you. Rivers, bad for you. Does that make sense uh, combat wise? The elevation of the terrain matters a lot, and that's something I really appreciate about this game. Finding some curiosities, and it looks like the Nubians have found us, and it's probably about time I talked a little bit more about this diplomacy screen. I, I haven't really said much about it. So on this screen, you can see a lot of information. The first thing you can see is the name and era of each of these civilizations. I'm the Egyptians in the ancient era. They are the Nubians in the ancient era. You can also see our current fame numbers. They are slightly ahead of me in fame. I'm currently last, but I will, you know, I feel like I'll, I'll kind of leap ahead in the not too distant future with a gazelle-like pace once I get a couple of these done. So there's a lot happening here on the screen. You can see my money. You can see our current war support. Generally, if these things are at 50, that means we're kind of not super heading in the direction of war. However, war still could happen. The hesitant here, this is their attitude towards me. And you can see the factors affecting that. Their trust of us is stable because our borders are close to them and we refuse to trade with them. And their strength compared to us is weaker because we have a much more powerful military, right? We spent all that time building up that 
that that military stack that we're currently walking around the map with completing uh militarist stars with that they haven't done so that has made them a little bit hesitant to deal with us because you know our intentions aren't known this is a careful character okay this uh mama oklo uh you can you can cycle through the different saves in the game i believe that you've met here with these buttons but mama oklo is a careful introvert so they tend to favor a defensive play style and they tend to focus on relationships with a few chosen civilizations so they're less likely to be grand diplomats wheeling and dealing with a bunch of civs they'll kind of pick maybe one or two their strengths are that they are expansionists so it's cheaper for them to absorb cities and they are protectors so they are good at defending their cities they also have a bias towards creating a strong defense on their borders and that's all of their abilities you can actually also unlock new abilities so for example diplomatic i believe is if you i think if you break treaties with other players you will become a traitor and that will give you certain benefits and if you defend other people i think you become a hero like if you liberate their cities and stuff like that i think i can't remember how this works the, it's not the game doesn't explain itself too well and i think that's a good thing because you kind of explore and try things now warrior and pacifist if you're at war a lot you'll get the warrior badge if you're at peace with a lot of civs and you have alliances you'll get the pacifist badge if you are uh pillaging people and doing all sorts of subvert covert nasty stuff to them you will get the thief badge or if you are trading with a bunch of people you get the merchant badge. i'm gonna go with the merchant direction i'm gonna go ahead and accept their offer to trade luxuries and i'm actually going to extend this trade deal to to more i'm gonna say hey why don't we trade strategics Right, so we can trade strategic resources now with the Everything Nubians. The Nubians are my adequate. friends. So now I can buy their horses because I don't have access to horses. And I want fantastic. access to horses. Right. Now, they're fairly expensive. We can trade. This is some more stuff. So these are, oh, man, there is so much going on on this screen. These are our relations. This tells us what is the current status of our alliance and stuff like that. We can propose an alliance. They're a little bit hesitant. So unlikely they will we probably have to build up our relationship maybe build up our treaties a little bit more we can trade with them we can import or export this little toggle here shows you where resources are going so for example if i come in here and i buy a copy of horses you can transport it by land and this is the route that the horses will take you can see this sort of dotted line the horses are coming along here and ending up in this city and that's if the, that I use a land trade route. If I go for a tr uh, naval trade route, they're kind of vulnerable to ransacking and pillaging and harbors being broken and stuff like that. But it's cheaper. It's cheaper to move things by sea generally. And this would also plant this directly in my capital. So if I go ahead and buy that, okay, created. if I toggle between import Commerce and export, you can see now that these... These like trading posts all along the way. If I if I if I exit out and zoom in, you might actually be able to see some of the trading ports. Yeah, you can see right here. There's actually now a little trade port here. Um to sort of represent that there's a bunch of trade coming through here. And all along that trading post, you know, information has been revealed about the map. We don't quite know a huge amount about the world, but because you know we've got like merchants heading over to their civilization now to, to sort of buy horses, we have a better idea of the world. We know that one of their cities is somewhere over here this is probably where the city center is let me know that they have another resource over here because we know generally where their stuff is so let's say i wanted to trade with them again and i wanted even more information let's say i bought the copper but i decided you know what i'm gonna send that by land because that'll come down over here and that might reveal more information for me so i'll buy this by land it's more expensive yes sure but now i get to see all these other trade trade posts and actually oh wow some of these are settled these locations these guys must have expanded a lot and um yeah so so trading is extremely valuable it gives you tons and 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 tons of information and on top of that i think it makes you a little bit of money if you trade things by sea boom right i'm making two extra gold per turn from trading now and uh you know it reveals the map and also the more you trade the closer you are to getting the merchant badge i'm not 100 percent sure how it works i believe because the game is launched i'm allowed to open this this is the humankind encyclopedia this is going to be a big deal for any of you guys who are new to the game you can pretty much type anything you want up here like merchant and you can figure things out so if i go merchant stars and click on here 
It is a whole... Ah, oh, it might not be... It might not be fully ready because the game isn't released yet, but there's a whole bunch of information here, and the game should be out now a couple of days, so it's totally fine for me to reveal this. Oh, but yeah, I would absolutely make heavy use of this. Um, learn about, you know, natural wonders, natural modifiers. You can learn about resources in here, for example. Uh, all the different resources in the game, where they can spawn, what their effects are. Plus one money on sage, for example. Plus one money on salt. I think some of these, yeah. Uh, but yeah, you can see like iron gives you, I think production, I'll give you science. But yeah, absolutely make use of this. It's huge. You can click on the Neolithic era, for example. I believe if there's a, let me see here, fame and cultures. Oh my God, dude, there's so, like this is one of the best guides um, that you're going to make use of in the game. Just type in what you need. Like if you're like a uh, spearman, what does spearman do? Click, there you go. Now you know what spearman does. It, Tells you all these sorts of things. I just, one suggestion, I wish this had a night mode. It's a beautiful encyclopedia though. Absolutely wonderfully put together. Make sure you make use of it. Uh, let's have a look. We have ourselves a little scout here. Now we could theoretically uh, skirmish with our opponents here and that would actually lower our relations with them. So I don't know if I want to do that, but I, what I absolutely will do is continue to expand my empire. 17 and 11 here feels really nice. So I'm going to pop that down there. Super duper duper want to be claiming more land. More land you hold the better, ideally. Hagmatana is over here. This one tends to spawn in like all of my games and they tend to be very, very aggressive. We're going to keep these guys healing. Oh, one of my units gained a veterancy. Uh, that's exciting. So veterancy is another way you can upgrade a unit's combat strength. They get plus one combat strength if they earn enough experience. Needless to say, plus one combat strength is a big deal. Um, one of the cool things in this game though, if some of you who are familiar with Endless Legends, is you can actually heal your units with gold. So it's kind of exciting. I don't have enough gold to fully heal my units, so I'll just wait one turn here with them. Um, and then pick up this curiosity. So the great thing from buying horses and copper from the Nubians is I can come into Memphis now. And if I wanted to, I could theoretically build horses, that horsemen now. I could also build the, the animal barns. And this is now worth 10 food because it's plus five food per horse. And it would also make my future farmer's quarters better. Now, 10 food might not seem like much, but when I'm go growing at 6% per turn on three food, 10 food could be... 10 to 20% extra growth per turn, which means more population, which means more tiles being worked. Can I pull this? I'm going to focus on food and science in my city and rely on these things to get most of my food, like working the tiles. I almost have the obelisk of the gods finished, which is my first shrine. We did get irrigation picked up. So we have flood irrigation now and public fountains, which are both going to help the stability. We did get a scientist star because we researched four technologies. So slowly creeping back up these ranks. They are on four stars now, though. I should hit some more stars soon. Should definitely. I, I, I can't be too far away. Now, let's keep founding outposts. The more land we claim the earlier into the game, I feel like the better off you are. And I'm, feel I'm feeling pretty confident here. I'm feeling like we can take on Hagmatana. So let's kind of make a move in that direction. Let's see if we can get a scout off on them. Now, my one worry here is that they will get to attack me downhill here, which is going to be a little bit spooky. Not going to lie. Efforts. So I think it would be a good idea now to pick up Calendar. I have inside my borders potentially more and more luxury resources. And I'm also going to pick up Bonsona here in my capital because I'd like to get another um, Egyptian pyramid. And this will also give my city a little bit more production, food, gold, the whole nine yards. So we'll go ahead and take that here. And uh, we get another population. I'm going to immediately put him into food or science. What do you think? I think I, I think I just want to stay around maintenance on food, like not too hard. Science is pretty important to me. I'd like to get another three techs to get the silver scientist star if I could, but I'm also going to go ahead and take a look at this land here. Let's see. Not really great spots for my Egyptian pyramid, but I can, I can do something. Seven production, eight production here. I'll pop you right down there. So I'll probably get that Egyptian pyramid next after the obelisk of the gods. Right, there is Calendar, which gives us access to the Artisan's Quarter, which lets us improve luxury resources. We also have access to the Granary, which gives us food per uh, our farmers, which means our farmers are more efficient and also gives us an extra farmer job, which is nice. And we completed a world deed. We built a holy site, which gave us 100 fame, uh, which is fantastic. We're also working on another Egyptian pyramid, which is an emblematic district, which will add to our districts here and I think I'm somewhat tempted now now that I have a second city who I can do things in like generate science I may go for like I may go ahead and use my land raiser ability here like whip all my guys over into production 
boosh press this button sacrifice five turns of gold and science but maybe raise a bunch of districts really quickly and burn my way through these builder stars that has an interesting appeal to me and i think i'm gonna do it because that puts me up over 100 production per turn and by doing that i can build like a couple like a maker's quarter in every zone and like just squeak up the productivity in my area you know maybe it's not the like most perfect plan but i think i think it's an interesting plan it allows me to use my ability to to chain together to to achieve a goal that sort of aligns with my civilization yes it sacrifices science at a time when science is kind of critical for me but i'm going to work on bronze working next uh, actually i don't need bronze working because i'm importing it so i'm going to work directly on wheel all right let's have a look at the damage here let's attack so it looks like we've attacked the city and we can maintain the siege, which will let these guys starve out. They have reinforcements of two warriors. I'm pretty sure they had a chariot and something else, although we, I think we killed that. So I think I should be able to fight this battle pretty easily on an assault. And I'll get to show off more game mechanics. Let's begin the manual battle. I'm going to have this archer go here and this archer go here. I'm going to keep this warrior here for a very specific reason. It'll become clear in a moment. I'll end my deployment. So you can see here, this is their levy. This is their city defender unit. And then right here is a flag. This is the reinforcement flag. Now, because I attacked, I get to go first, which means I have the option if I want to be able to put a unit and block these reinforcements from reaching the battle. Now, my unit will take damage from basically fighting off map off of this battle map and if he kills this unit he can get these units into battle but this is kind of like if if you've played into the breach which was kind of a um indie turn-based strategy game you could stand on where the enemy spawns were coming in order to prevent them from spawning and that would um that would damage your unit but it would buy you time so it's kind of kind of a, kind of a similar concept and because now that i'm blocking these reinforcements we're not under a massive time pressure to take these guys out we can kind of use our archers liberally and uh their city wasn't developed enough to actually have fortification but if you look you can see here the levy actually has a bunch of combat bonuses uh, that's because these are basically like your crappy garrison units. They have the home guard ability. They appear automatically. Uh, they are behind walls. So you can see this kind of like little bit of wood stock things. Those count as fortifications, which gives them a small combat boost against enemies who aren't inside the walls. The walls can be, you know, encompassing, you know, multiple multiple tiles in fact an entire zone can nearly be covered in walls and so if you guard the edge of those walls it's very hard to get in and uh break this behind walls bonus because they're defending they get extra combat strength because they're in a city they get extra combat strength and then i think because they're damaged they'll just take more damage so there you go hopefully this was uh, a good little primer on some of the possibilities that can happen here uh, and we, in fact, won that battle. We got a Militarist Star. Cool. So we killed a bunch of units. We got a Militarist Star. We also got the Expansionist Star from capturing a territory. And here's the really, really cool thing about clearing these. Is we didn't just get a like an outpost. We actually got a full-fledged city out of this. Now, there is a downside. Um, we are now currently over our city cap. So because we're over our city cap, we're taking 10 influence penalty per turn. It's not a huge penalty, but as you kind of exceed that cap more and more, that penalty is going to get a lot worse. But now if we look at the map, look at the control we have. We control over here Memphis, we control Hagmatana, we control Thebes, and then there's kind of these like neutral guys in between us. We are building up our relationship with the Akkadians, and we are currently at a tolerant level with these guys. These guys are peaceful. What I'm thinking of doing is assimilating Akkad, maybe hiring their units as what you call them hiring them as mercenaries and then using those mercenary units in conjunction with my own unit to take out Harakana or whatever it's called so that's kind of like my current game plan so let's go ahead and pop down another outpost because if you expand using just influence your expansion is going to be fairly slow it's going to be very defensive and you know you always get stars for killing things so don't be too afraid to be a little bit aggressive in this game, particularly against the neutral. And that's why building an army early is important and then making use of that army early is important. So we built a Nubian pyramid or a um, Egyptian period. I keep saying Nubian because the Nubians are in the game. Uh, let's go ahead and pick up a pottery workshop. I find influence is just king in, 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 a lot of these, in a lot of these games, a lot of these cases. It allows you to pass laws. It lets you um, modify your terrain. We got an Estite star. The Estite star is what you get for earning influence. And now we're starting to get to the point where we can start considering moving on to the next era. I don't know if I'm quite ready for that, but I would like to hunt down this enemy stack. Um, it's only two warriors, which should be a relatively easy battle for me. 
especially because my units are starting to become very experienced. But let's manually battle this out, and we'll just kind of go with the default deployment. It should be fairly easy for us to um, get an advantage because we have two units in advantage, and both of our, and two of our units are veterans. Um, that's only going to become more and more of an advantage as time comes along. Especially because our warriors have a base strength of 21 compared to their 19 or whatever. All right, let's go ahead and start taking them on out. We'll take a little bit of retaliation damage. Actually, I'm a little bit worried about this downhill attack, but it looks like we managed to survive it just fine. So we can use our archers to clean this up. Um, your warriors are actually quite vulnerable to death. These guys are hard to keep alive, so you want to be careful with them because one bad attack, especially in the mid game where there's a lot of range units happening and range units kind of get special abilities and become more powerful. Gotta be careful. Our religion has upgraded. I feel like I've spent the last like two and a half hours of playing this game explaining a new mechanic every few minutes. And that's just the way it is when you play these like extremely complex 4X games. It's a part of the part of the world. But hopefully as you guys are watching and learning and stuff like that, you're getting a better idea of things. So we have a bunch of choices here because now 25 individual population units in the world are following our religion. So we can do a lot of really cool things. Uh, we can choose our first tier one tenet of our religion. So for example, we could go for Eschew Gluttony. This would give us plus five money on luxury resource deposits and allow us to build another holy site. Uh, we could go with uh, Be in Harmony with Nature, which, give us, which would give us extra stability on rivers. This would actually be really, really powerful for us because we have a ton of rivers in our empire. Uh, we could go with Steel Knot, which would give us influence on mountains. Very, very powerful. Smite Unbelievers would make our units cheaper to maintain by lowering their upkeep and give us extra experience when we create units, allowing us to get more highly experienced units, which means higher combat strength. Purge Idleness would give us uh, food from lakes and coastal waters. That seems pretty damn good if you go for something like the Phoenicians who have very powerful harbor buildings. Abstain from uh, intoxicants gives us extra industry on forest and woodlands. That seems really powerful with what we're doing, where we already get a bonus to production on those, on like any tile that makes production. Um, seek wisdom gives us science and strategic resource deposits. That's very powerful because we actually do have quite a few strategic resource deposits in our empire. And then there's tithe the wealthy, which would give us war support when we win a battle and also give us war support when an opponent retreats from battles. So this is more about like actually kind of strategically winning a war rather than actually fighting the war, whereas this is more about fighting the war. I think usually when you want to go for a religion, you either you either want to reinforce a strength to make your powerful the powerful part of your empire like even more oppressively powerful or you want to shore up a critical weakness so if i were to analyze the game as we're playing it right now right we're currently in the first era we are churning out an insane amount of production out of our capital so if i were to go for reinforcing my powerful part of my civilization i would maybe go for abstain from an uh, intoxicants here to get extra production from these tiles because that makes the powerful part of my civilization punch even harder. Alternatively, you can go for maybe something with a little bit of utility. So something with a little bit of utility might be like Smite Unbelievers or Steel Knot for a little bit of influence or be in harmony for a little bit of stability. So this would be punch harder and these three would be utility. And then there's the shore up a weakness choice and seek wisdom would shore up a weakness because right now science is our weakness. We're making six science per turn. We have one, two, uh, let's see here, three, potentially four, maybe five strategic resources inside our empire. That's worth 25 science per turn, which would shore up our very, very, very weak science. So I think, I think I'm gonna go for seek wisdom here to shore up our weak science. Now, when you choose a tenant, you can also change your religion. So we don't have to be Egyptian polytheism. We can, in fact, do something like uh, we can become Christianity if we wanted to. Uh, I feel like maybe it would be more appropriate for us to do something like um, Egypt is like close to where Judaism was, but not quite. I'm trying to think of like what would be a good. Can we like I think we can rename it ourselves, actually. Hang on. So I'll just pick like the look of Judaism, because I like the look of it. Um, I'll choose this tenet. And then I think if I go to my religion screen, I can actually rename it to like Pharaoh Worship. So I'll, I'll rename it there and boom. Now, when we're on the religion screen, you'll see here it says Pharaoh Worship on the map. And you can see my religion is actually spreading pretty actively. That's because I like spent a lot of my early game building a shrine. Like it took me, what, seven turns to make that? A lot happens in seven turns. 
So it looks like the Nubians uh, now have a pleasant attitude towards me because they have more trade between us and we aired grievances and stuff like that. Maybe it would be time to consider upgrading our relationship in another way. A game of prophecy. Uh, so this looks like a some kind of prophetic wisdom stuff. Oh, this is actually a reference to... Um, Tom Scott has a video on this game. It's like the Babylonian Kings game. I can't remember what it's called, but it's very, very cool. Uh, it's kind of like, I don't know how to describe it, but it's like a racing game. It's like a racing board game, weirdly enough. So I can silence this, which will cost me 80 gold, but move me more in the direction of authority rather than liberty. I can overlook it, which will give me the defiant effect on Memphis, which will lower the city's stability. However, it would move me back towards that liberty axis, which would give me that extra two influence on my emblem emblematic district, which is something that I definitely want. Or I could heed their warning, gain superstitious, lose a bit of science and move to more towards um, tradition. I think I'm going to choose overlook here because losing a bit of stability doesn't hurt me too much. I will lose 10 stability in total, but I gain a ton of extra influence there an extra six influence per turn and that will only climb as i finish more of those pyramids across my empire nice so we just unlocked the builder star from building things right on the cusp of advancing it looks like one of our opponents has actually advanced to the next era however i would like to maybe spend just a little bit more time inside this era so let's attach a territory here to this city and begin work on an egyptian pyramid i want to get as many of those out as possible because it's part of my mission i need to get another six I need to get another six districts out, which is a tall, tall, tall order. So it looks like the Nubians would like to get a non-aggression pact. I'm going to accept that because I don't, I don't have a reason to go to war with them. I'm more interested in maybe going to war with the Mycenaeans because they're like right on my border and they're pretty aggressive. And there's like a little bit of vulnerable land here that I don't, I don't want to lose. The Harappans would like to trade luxuries. I'm going to accept that and then see what they have for sale. So they have saffron and gemstones. Saffron will give you plus four stability per saffron on all cities as well as plus two food per saffron on farm farmer quarters gemstones will give you plus four stability per gemstone on all cities and also plus two money per gemstone on maker's quarters so these are pretty powerful pretty 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 powerful but not super good anyone else have anything to trade you have sage and saffron gemstones and saffron what does sage do sage is ooh, i like sage so sage is actually really really good for me here sage gives stability like all luxury resources which naturally um of course right oh no i can't afford it ah, damn it well basically sage gives you plus three food per territory which is very very powerful so my capital would get nine food which seems pretty damn good my stability is rapidly declining in my capital, but I'm shoring it up by continuously building districts. Um, that's sort of the power of a builder. That's what they can do. That's like their whole shtick. So it looks like the borders over here are solidified. So I'm going to like pop out ASAP. And it looks like most of the land that there's to claim is to the east of my capital and maybe a little bit to the west of Hagmatana. But I feel like I've managed to carve out, carve out a pretty sizable chunk of this, this map for myself. I do want to slice off a chunk of this over here for myself. This would be a great merchant's quarter to pop these guys over. That's exactly where I want to put it. So we'll see if we can get it there next turn. The Descendants of Kings. So I can get higher movement speed of my units or I can get money for science or I can get celebrating. I think I think I'll take the extra movement on my units. The extra little bit of movement might turn out well. Can't afford your sage. I may as well buy the saffron because it might get me the merchant flag and it reveals more trading posts on the map and it increases my relationship with these guys. Wait, why do they have war support? Okay, no, their war support is coming down. Let's offer to trade everything with the Harappans. I think this. I'm gonna, oh yes, I could buy their copper. Fantastic. Now buying copper is super, super powerful myself. because there is a building you can unlock somewhere in here. Oh God, where is it? There it is, the forge. And the forge gives you five production per copper. And that includes ones you trade for. So that's really, really powerful. So if I can if I can come in here and, and trade with the Harappans to pick up copper, I will. Uh, it's only 57 gold per. Absolutely. Give me those, please. But uh, yeah, look at this. Look how much of the map is being revealed just from our trade routes. That That's why, why trading is a big, big deal in this game. It gives you vision. It improves your relationships. It gives you access to resources you otherwise shouldn't have or wouldn't have access to. We got an agrarian star. And this is where we reach a fork in the road. We are at a important decision point for our civilization now because we can actually advance to the next era. And this 
represents a whole web of new choices for us as a player because we have to consider what has happened in this game what the situation we are in right now and what the situation will look like in the next era so we have to like try to consider all of that with what we're going to be doing so the simplest version of this choice is actually just not advancing like let's say we're trying to get as much fame as possible and we know that if we hang around for a few more turns we'll maybe get another technology or two researched and finish off this star. We'll maybe get an extra few kills. We'll maybe get enough territory for another star here, right? So it, there, there are times when it's worth it for us to sit here. And I think this is one of those times where it's worth it to sit here. There is an opportunity cost here though, because the longer we sit around, the more of these civilizations will be claimed by other players, which is super not good for us because then we're, we will be pigeonholed. Maybe like the Greeks are like the perfect follow-up to the Egyptians. All right, let's just imagine. I don't know if it's true. I don't think it's true. But let's imagine it was. And like the Greeks, the second you're done being Egyptians, you want to go Greeks in this particular game for a variety of reasons. But I decide to delay my cultural advancement because I want a particular thing. Boom, someone else picks Greece. Now I'm locked out of that decision forever because only one person can be each sieve. So we'll look at this decision a little bit more in depth. But mostly what I'm looking to do here is I'd like to get silver on the Builder Star silver on this star and silver on on this star i should be able to do all of those pretty quick because i'm currently working on three districts which is half of what i need for that uh the builder star and i'm ready soon to attach another territory to one of my cities like i could attach this for 30 which will get me the silver territory star so i'm very very close to where i need to be ah the last other line so i have the option to lock down memphis which will give me stability and increase my direction towards tradition i can also become more authoritarian which is kind of how i would go personally because that extra production is nice or i can kind of eh, maybe move in the accept direction i'm going to move in the accept direction because this doesn't negatively affect my liberty thing that i want going here and it also doesn't negatively affect me in the tradition direction so like so you, are you understanding you have to like make a decision between oh man my ideology and the bonuses i get for picking a particular choice there's like th this game is filled with all Other of those kind of choices and it's part wondering. of why i love it so much in a perfect world i would have also picked up another four kills to get the militarist star um but that's just not going to happen i'm also going to now turn off this star and move everyone i can into scientific production so i can get those extra two technologies that i need asap the city has relatively bad stability but i don't have time to slow down i need more districts so more districts i will build because it's part of my main mission i mean in a perfect world i would go all the way up to 18 districts and get the full triple star and i may actually do that this game because you know delaying your era advancement it's not the worst thing in the world you don't you don't actually have to rush like there's a benefit to rushing for sure, but you don't have to rush. You can take your time. Ooh, 28 production over here. Hell yes. Very bad food, but absolutely worth it for the other things. Um, and in Hagmatana, I'm going to go ahead and attach this territory. That'll give me an expansionist star, which is perfect, which gives us a little bit more era score. Ooh, one more territory and I can actually get the gold star here. I'm super down for that. Um, that's quite expensive is the thing. 200 and 30 uh, influence but we might be able to pull that off and i'm thinking in thebes after this nubian pyramid i should maybe get like an archer or two to go fight these guys so i might put some time into getting archers here and tell the city to focus on city growth production in particular now the one downside of me going on this like ancient era crusade against um harakanga is all of my military is going to be concentrated over here and this is my biggest rival right here orange so I'm, I'm making some sacrifices here oh schism of the heart so we have religious tolerance i think this has to do with the fact that we have found an enemy religion so or something like that i don't know how this is triggered we can choose to move towards world right away from homeland or we could choose to move towards homeland away from world. If you move more towards homeland, our units would get stronger. So this would give us plus five faith on our territories, allowing us to spread our religion more effectively. And it would give us another grievance against empires with a different state religion, which would give us more opportunities to go to war. However, if I take this, this is a lot of influence, but there is like a diminishing return on how much influence you get. This is a ton of influence, but do I need that much influence? Maybe I'd be better if I just had like really good faith spread. And I kind of like the idea 
of taking that faith spread but i'm not going to make this choice right now because i'm trying to save influence for now and this is going to be a position you frequently find yourself in this game i have a ton of decisions i want to make here but influence is just you know it needs to be spent somewhere and actually probably about time that we took a real look at the influence society map mode you could see all of the um things that are influencing this uh this place so you can see here there's, there's quite a bit of influence coming from me there's 36 coming from me and 29 coming from the mycenaeans so that's why this this territory here is sort of half theirs and half mine because our influence is relatively balanced so influence is quite important to generate in order to um push back other people's influence and it's the same thing with faith um we've encountered another religion however my religion is incredibly powerful and it's pushing very hard against my enemies so we just unlocked the wheel so we have access to the markabata and i think i would like to build that we got also got a merchant star which is perfect it's like it's all kind of flowing together very nicely now other players are starting to finish this era uh i don't think i'm going to get another merchant star i will get another scientific star i will definitely get another expansionist star eh, it's unlikely i get the estate star but uh you want to you want to pick up as many of these stars as you can at least in my opinion i think it's a more fun and interesting way to play the game, if nothing else. Okay. So the Nubians are offering me open borders. I'm going to accept that, this and I'm going to offer them share maps. Deal. Right, let's share our maps. Make so sure now that we have shared our map, see the blue I can actually see everything they can see. So they have Kerma and Napata. So they're actually quite crammed into the corner here, and they also have pretty good vision of the Harappans. So it looks like I am the dominant superpower on this map, or at the very least, I am a nascent superpower. I am... Um, theoretically the largest nation on the map and i have the largest potential thanks to these neutral guys that i plan to take over but i'm in a vulnerable position i'm kind of surrounded by on all sides by civilizations who may or may not be friendly to me uh harappans want a non-aggression pact so I'm, I'm i'm liking this plan where i play diplomacy to the east and i play war to the west now part of the reason i'm doing so well is that i have you know 100 hours in the game so i'm, I'm relatively familiar with it but also that um i'm playing on a fairly low difficulty setting oh dear Okay, like an angry, a pair of angry boys appeared here. Well, thankfully I have a military in the area and also I can upgrade my archers to these chariot archers, which I will absolutely do because these are just straight up upgrades. These guys have a baseline 20 combat strength. These have a baseline 24. If I upgrade, it's 90 gold. And now this guy has 27 combat strength. So this is just basically a free win for me. And then I think units can actually oddly still move after they upgrade. So I can I can work on clearing these guys out instantly, gain more experience on my units. I'll do this battle manually, but it is by no means necessary. Um, I just find I like I like to manually do my battles. Uh, it keeps me from losing them. Man, look at this damage this archer is about to take. Jesus Christ, 55. But that was a big hit. 55. And we take a pretty hefty counterattack. Not the worst. Attack and attack. That should just about kill him. I may have to go uphill against him to get it, but that's fine. Boom! We got the kill. We cleared him out. Picked up some more militarist stars. In fact, I'm very, very close to picking that up. So maybe a little bit more combat might be in order here. And uh, I got a ton of tech behind me so let's pick up bronze working yeah look at that i'm up to 65 tech per turn now that feels good like remember a few turns ago i was on four <laughs> so i want you to think about that one all right this game is very much so a game of swinging <laughs> swinging yo big old pee pee around no uh, about swings and power it's about like timing the right the right moment to uh to attack someone to to do what you need to do Bronze working researched. We got the scientific Aristar. I think I only need three more. Oh, we can claim a world wonder. I completely forgot about world wonders. That's another game mechanic I could spend five minutes talking about. So world wonders are kind of a little bit different to this game if you've played anything similar. Um, if you remember earlier, I was able to build this shrine. And when I built the shrine, the thing actually appeared on the map. Let's do that again for the sake of showing it off. So let's say, uh, you know what, over here, this looks like, uh, let's put the shrine over here by the mountain. Why not? Right, pop a shrine down there. Now you see, when I exit the city, this shrine exists as a empire-wide project. I can have multiple cities work on this. If I click this button up here, I can tell all of these cities, hey, put all of your production towards this and I can get it built in two turns. Now it cancels everything else I'm building, 
and puts all that stuff on the back burner. But I can get this built in two turns and wonders work the exact same way. But you first you have to build up enough influence to actually claim the wonder. Now, depending on the wonder, you'll get a huge amount of advantages. Oh my God, I should have got the Pyramid of Giza. It actually combos so well with Egyptians. The Harappans got it. So the Pyramid of Giza, uh, uh, you need to save up a certain amount of influence so that you can claim a wonder and then you need to build it. And wonders are expensive. The Pyramid of Giza gives you 20 stability, 100 fame and 25% discount on your um, on your district. So this is actually super powerful for building really big cities. Then there's the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, which gives you 20 stability, 100 fame, and extracts a luxury resource. So pretty interesting one. Then you've got Stonehenge. This gives you plus 10 food per co-religious state. I think this is plus 10 food for every civilization that is following your religion and plus five stability for every religion that's following your, uh, for, every for every religion or for every state that's following your religion. Oh my God, that's hard to say. Jesus. Uh, you get 20 faith. 40 stability and 5% of the food on the capital of empires following the same religion. So other empires get benefits. This is more of like a diplomatic religious kind of direction, which could be an interesting one to go for. And then the Temple of Artemis is your warlike he units heal and ignore forest penalties. This also counts as a holy site, as does Stonehenge. Yes, special effects is considered as a holy site, but does not count towards the holy site cap. So this is a great way to spread your religion is to build Stonehenge. Um, Temple of Artemis is also a holy site. It gives you faith and faith spreads your religion. Stability gives you, um, you can build more districts, gives you health regen, fame. So of these two, I, I think I'm going to go for Temple of Artemis because that just seems more fun. We'll, we'll, we'll claim it, right? It's 250. And now we can build a Temple of Artemis. It's 1,260 production, uh, but I can place it pretty much anywhere. And it's like a very, like, big, obvious thing. And the really cool thing about Wonders is they exploit all of the terrain around them. So, like, if I had, I don't know, like, really good terrain over here, for example, and I placed this down, I would get all the yield from all of the terrain around it. So placement of your Wonders can, uh, you know, have meaningful impact on the yields of your cities. I wouldn't say it's, like, super important but it can have meaningful impacts like if i place the temple of artemis here in this nook of all these mountains i would get a ton of production like three four i'm already producing that one you know what i mean like i would pick up production from all these tiles speaking of which let's find like a cool spot to place this yeah right there to grab a bunch of production a little bit of food but let's do the shrine first and then we'll maybe consider that one i don't actually want to build my shrine or my artemis yet though so i'm gonna prioritize the things I was already building. But yeah, man, the more I play this game, the more stuff just feels like needs to be explained. <laughs> um, but hey, I, that's part of that's part of any new 4X game. Things are big, things are complicated. But once we get there in the end, you guys are going to be super happy. Ah, uh, yes. Okay, so the Akkadians, who I gave money a long time ago, our relationship has now upgraded to cordial. Uh, this independent people will not attack me. I can be hire their armies as mercenaries and they share their map vision with me and I can buy their resources. So I could come in here and be like, hey, I wish to buy your sage. I wish to buy your copper. Uh, I can also, if we get to the next level of patronage, I can actually take over their civilization. I can assimilate them. So if I find the right army here, like these guys, Spearman Warrior, I can add them to my own army and for 20 turns use them against the Harakanians, which might be the right move. Okay, I need three more techs. So let's, let's look for cheap techs that we can finish in one turn. Masonry, fishing, and maybe riding. I think riding, actually, the first person to research riding gets, um, gets fame. Oh, that's nice. So the Nubians just used an ability on me, which actually improved a luxury inside my territory. That is a ability unique to merchant class uh, civilizations or, or cultures. They can actually like spend money to improve other people's territory because they have like a resource that they really want. So they're like, hey, we'll pay for this. Uh, yeah, let's keep claiming territory. I'm going very, very super wide here. Ah, uh, we've experienced a flood. So you can choose to gamble, which will eh, potentially have good or potentially bad consequences. Usually terrible. Uh, you can adapt, which has a small chance of bad consequences, but moves you more towards society. Or you can choose to progress towards the social progress, get a little bit more science. Um, I think I'm going to go for the protect. I'll spend the money and try to get the good consequences as well as the extra science. Masonry has been researched and now we have access to forced labor, which is another game mechanic worthy of a couple of minutes of talking. Oh, violence. Uh, we've earned a builder star. Awesome. So we need another five districts to get our gold uh, builder star. Two more science 
And one more territory. Wow, we're actually really, really close to hitting a lot of these. Um, but apparently there's been some violence over Please, here. Trade routes have been blocked due to violence. I assume some sort of battle is taking place somewhere along this trade route. If I click on it, um, or if I click on the Nubians and go to my exports, you can see I'm exporting here. So there's some sort of violence along this trade route that's keeping them from grabbing these resources from me. So let's move in here, hire the mercs, boom, we have the mercs. I did research the thing that lets me reinforce battles, right? No, I didn't. Oh my God, I'm a moron. I won't even be able to use these mercenaries in my battle. Well, <laughs> you know what? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you're a little dumb. Sometimes your brain no work good. That's life. All right, boom. Upgrade this guy to Markabata. Now I have two of these armies, two warriors, two Markabatas, two, two melee, two range. Seems like a pretty good early game composition. Then I would maybe start adding more ranged units. Now the problem is if I attack now without this reinforcements tech, we're gonna be meat, mince meat. So the builder star, I need five more districts. Well, could also pick up a lot of science from building these strategic extractors, particularly on the copper, which may speed up my science in the long run. I got low stability. I don't know if I can afford to pump hard on my stability much longer. Food in here is pretty bad. I don't think, well, I actually, I have three copies of horses, but I really need districts. I think the artisan's quarter might actually count as a district. So let's go ahead and get these luxuries online uh, for two reasons. First of all, I think they might count as quarters. And second of all, they'll give me money and they'll give me stability, which will help out my cities a little bit. Because my stability is currently tanking because I'm, I'm building so vertically so quickly that my cities can't really keep up. Um, and that's becoming a problem for me. So the Nubians have advanced as the Mayans. We got an Estite star. People are converting. I can ask for reparations. Yes. Uh, people are buying. Ooh, they're buying my resources. And we are like on the cusp of advancing here. On the, on the literal cusp. We just need two techs, four more of these, maybe two more people. Man, we have got so much error score. Or not error score, that's a different game. <laughs> Wrong game. This is meant to be sponsored too. <laughs> ah, I know which game I'm playing. <laughs> I'm not an idiot. Hey, finally, we have maxed out our relations with a CAD, which means we can spend influence to assimilate them. Boom. One of the expansionist you stars has been seen. earned. We've got two gold stars, soon to be three. And here's a really, really cool thing. Uh, we inherit their army. So we just got a ton of chariots, a ton of archers. Um, even these guys that I hired, I think I get to keep them. Though maybe hiring them was pointless. But it might mean that I get to maybe select my battle a little bit more carefully now. But yes, on the cusp of talking about how to pick your next culture. I will call it there. I love you all very, very much. I hope you guys are enjoying this Humankind series and I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.